Good morning. I am Soledad Nosha. I'm the Secretary Director at the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. Welcome to this webinar, Research Networks about uh, Global Past Changes in Latin America and the Caribbean. This webinar is co-organized by the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research and Pages, Past Global Changes. I would like to tell you that there is that we have simultaneous interpretation. This you can access interpretation if you click a button at the uh, bottom of the screen, and there you can choose the language of your choice. This webinar is also being recorded so that we can then share the recording with all of you. This webinar will be moderated by two young, brilliant scientists, Juliana Nogueira and Eugenia Ferrero. They are, they are both uh, Global Past Changes researchers and they are part of the PAGES Scientific Committee. They will be introducing the fellows that are here with us today to tell us about their experiences. Thank you both of you for participating as moderators in this webinar. It's an honor to have also the presence of Dr. Marie-France Lutre, who is executive director of PAGES. She, she's a prestigious researcher who has published over 100 papers. She's a doctor of science uh, on paleoclimate. She worked as a researcher at several institutions, and formerly she has helped several laboratories in France and the UK, and also she has uh, done more informal work around the world. The world. It's amazing to have Marie France here with us today. Thank you for being here. We also have Marcela Ojira, who is a, a, a vice uh, executive vice director and capacity building um, director at the IAI. She has developed strategies, uh, programs, and activities to promote uh, global change research and decision making. She has a master's degree in international relations, international uh, economics, and the environment, as awarded by the University of John Hopkins. Marcela, you have the floor. Thank you, Soledad, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Marcelo Hira. I'm the II Deputy Executive Director, Director for Capacity Building. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here uh, and to share with you, Mary friends, the opening remarks for this incredible webinar that we are organizing uh, with PAGES and IAI. Um, it's also a pleasure to welcome everyone to this webinar. I cannot express how happy we are, not only because of the nature of the fellowship program that PAGES and IAI have supported over the last two years, embarking on the third year of our collaboration, and also the significance of supporting early career scientists in paleoclimate sciences, areas of global environmental change that are so important, not only for the science, but also for establishing and providing opportunities for network building across the Americas, particularly Latin America and the Caribbean, promoting South and South collaboration. Without those fellowship opportunities, we understand how difficult it is for early career researchers to not only get up-to-date scientific information, access to knowledge, data, but also opportunities to collaborate across borders, uh, across sectors, institutions, academic universities, laboratories, but countries, sharing experiences that are from their natural and home countries with others, uh, lessons learned and learning from other environments, not only in the science for professional and uh, personal goals, but also institutional. Another important goal that the IEI and PAGES share is to provide opportunities for 
professional and personal individual growth, but also strengthening institutional capacities, governance capacities at universities, laboratories, government agencies that can use the best solid scientific information to support decision-making, to create and encourage more scientific initiatives and collaborations across borders. So with those words, I'd like to welcome especially the fellows who are here to share their experience with the IA and the PAGES uh, Fellowship Program. Also the speakers and the PAGES scientific community members who will help us guiding this discussion and to the overall audience for being interested in learning from the fellows and from our institutions the experience of uh, sharing knowledge cross borders. So thank you very much for your participation. Um, shall I start? I don't know if Marie France wanted to add something. Um, yes, I can add a few words. Um, so it, it's, it's clearly my pleasure and I'm extremely happy to be here to see and you all will see in virtual mode and to welcome you for, for this webinar. And uh, as um, Marcela said, we, we are here mostly to talk about networking, networking in South American and Caribbean region um, within the context of PAGES and IAI partnerships. So um, as, uh, as you said, Marcela, that we invited several speakers to talk about their experience uh, of the Mobility Fellowship Program that uh, PAGES and IEI developed. And um, we also invited additional participants to discuss about their experience of networking, collaboration, international co cooperation, how much it is important. And so we, we hope that um, this webinar will not only be the, the end, will not be the end, but will be the start of a discussion about what can be done to to favor and develop uh, interdisciplinary and international collaboration uh, amongst uh, Latin American and uh, the Caribbean uh, regions. And uh, well, because you gave me the floor, I would like to take this opportunity to to say a few words about uh, pages. And um, well, so you should pr probably see uh, the, the my, my screen, which is uh, the the website of Pages. And um, so, well, everything that I will talk, you can find it on the on the website. So it's it, there is nothing new. The website uh, pastglobalchange.org. Um, and um, I, I, will, I would really like to invite you and to encourage you to, to explore the website. And I want to share only very few highlights of uh, what you can find. And in particular, all the, the working groups or the, most of the activity of PAGES is taking place through the, the working group on different topics. These groups are, well, they are built around a question uh, a scientific question that one single person or even not one single team cannot answer. And so they need to group together their force uh, to their strength, their power to, to answer that question. That's how this, uh, this group are built, but they are really very open. So if you want to join them, they have a mailing list that you can join. You can also attend their activity. They, most of them have a workshop, a meeting, uh, once a year, so you can attend that meeting. And most of the time, there is some uh, financial support available for, for those meetings. So don't hesitate to take part in the activities of the, the working group. The, the other point that I want to highlight is the early career network uh, that uh, has been developed within PAGES. And so I will not enter into the detail of all the activities that they, they are running because then uh, we are still here in half an hour or even more. Uh, but uh, amongst other, they are organizing in collaboration with INQUA an early career workshop. And the last one took place in Chile last November on past social environmental systems. 
And then, of course, the reason why we are here, it's the Mobility uh, Research Fellowship Program that uh, Marcela already mentioned, uh, that, um, that is there really to start or to continue to work in collaboration in a slightly smaller region, so in, in a subcontinent rather than globally. So it's a first step of, um, of collaboration or maybe one more in a collaboration that is already existing. And um, the, the call for the, the next uh, uh, mobility fellowship will be open very soon. So be careful not to miss it. And then to conclude, well, just uh, join pages. You can create your profile on the, the people database. So you will receive regularly information about um, what we are doing and uh, what's happening within pages. And of course, explore our website. So I will stop here. And um, well, uh, again, I, I guess I give you the, the floor for the second part of this uh, webinar. Thank you. Marie France. Very briefly, I would like to tell you about the structure of the workshop. Together with Juliana, we will be moderating this workshop. I am Eugenia Ferrero. I am an associate researcher at CONICET Argentina, and I work on endocrinology, and I, I study the ecology and climate reconstructions in tropical forests in South America. Juliana is Brazilian. She is now working as a researcher at the University of Prague. She also works with uh, water rings in order to rebuild environmental changes in several parts of the world. With Juliana, we will be introducing Matias and Monica. They are the fellows that have talked to us. And Matías, we will introduce Matías. You will have uh, five minutes to talk about the work you've done and your scholarship. Then Monica. And then we will go on to the researchers that have kindly agreed to share this event with us. So first of all, Matías. Matías Varenceli. She has a PhD awarded by the National University of Córdoba. She he is now a researcher at the Multidisciplinary Institute of Plant Biology in Córdoba. He received this PAGES and IAI fellowship in 2021 uh, during his postdoc. And now he will make a presentation on his experience. Matías, you have the floor. Thank you, Maria Eugenia. Uh, hello, everyone. I'd like to share my screen now. Um, I am Matias, and I would like to tell you about my connection with the IAI and Pages when I received the scholarship. My research focuses on phylogeography. We work, we study the genealogical relations between populations among populations in order to study the processes that, that govern the distribution. And we mainly use genetic variation in and within populations to conduct these studies. For instance, in my, in my PhD, I focused on past climate changes in the glacier eras uh, in, the re in the arid regions of Argentina and Chile. I'm sorry, the audio is really bad quality. I'll try to do my best to, to summarize what he's saying. Thank you. Uh, we studied the biodiversity in the populations. And this is very important to uh, address the magnitude of climate change and how species have responded throughout the distribution range. This has major implications, not just for biogeography, bio but also other areas such as 
taxonomy and biodiversity conservation. Um, later on in my career, I uh, studied, I conducted comparative studies. And within the Patagonia, which is a, an, a, a large prairie in the south of Argentina, we compiled every phylogeogra phylogeographical study in order to uh, find out about the uh, patterns in the species and also to connect this to past climate change to see if this helped us see how species respond to current climate change. This allowed us to determine high diversity areas that had been unstable in the climate. And at that time, they were at risk because of accelerated climate change. Therefore, there is this connection between past and current climate change that uh, made me contact Dr. Santiago Ramirez Barahona from the Biology Institute UNAM. I did this through the IAI and PAGES Fellowship. The idea was to implement this globally, to summarize biodiversity maps globally and also phylogenetically in, on, in order to understand how these global biodiversity panels, the, uh, patterns that we see today are shaped or have been, may have been shaped by past climate change. Santiago is a young macroecologist. He's just slightly older than me, but he's um, brilliant. Our connection is truly fruitful. When I stayed in the city of Mexico uh, and when I worked with him, we did some bioinformatic work in order to have this, these global maps. Uh, here we have important phylogenetic information. And um, on the right, we can see the maps that we used in the city of Mexico. We used this information to try and uh, determine how these global patterns have been shaped by past global changes. <clears throat> this is how we're having very interesting results. Uh, different types of uh, genetic diversity, phylogenetic diversity, and which areas have been the most affected where we find um, the clearest signs of past climate change. Also, the arid and tropical areas where we can see uh, the spatial signs clearly. Uh, what is most important about these, this study conducted with Santiago and colleagues is this connection between different types of biodiversity areas in Latin America. Santiago was able, uh, during our work together, Santiago helped me with several concerns. And, and this really helped helped me fill many gaps. Hopefully this um, connection with him will allow us to continue working in the future. Thank you, Matias. Thank you for the chance as well. Now let's have Monica Vicente. Monica, are you there? Okay. Monica is an, an forestry engineer in Bolivia. She's currently a professor at the uh, Autonomous University Gabriel René Moreno, Bolivia. She received this fellowship in 2022. And she uh, worked with natural resources and also worked with the Universidad Estatal Mayor. Monica, you have five minutes to tell us about what you do and what you have done uh, during the fellowship. Thank you. Good morning. I will share my screen now. I have 
did the exchange last year from March to May, and during the exchange, I did this um, research about uh, the dendrochronological potential of a species at Tarara Colorada in the dry forests in Bolivia. To highlight the importance of research in my area, we have a lot of tropical, dry, tropical forests in Bolivia that have very long periods of drought and high rates of deforestation that uh, on which there is a national policy focused uh, the forests. And in 2019, we almost had a catastrophe where over 40 million hectares were burnt in Bolivia and 60% of it was forest areas. So over 40 million trees were burned and many of the uh, trees that were burned were uh, individuals of the Platinisium ulei for, uh, species which is exported and is growing in all this area of Bolivia. The objective of this research was to evaluate the dendrochronological potential of the species and the dry tropical forest and identify the anatomical features, uh, the especially concerning growth rings and uh, patterns of growth according to the climate patterns in the area. This was done in the department of Santa Cruz on the east area in the municipality of Concepcion. And other than the collection of samples, the, during the methodological process, there was a, a preparation of the woody material, the microscopical observation, and all the process of data collection was done in the laboratories of John England in Mendoza in Argentina. And the results that have been observed, first of all, is the anatomical determination of the growth rings of the species and afterwards we have obtained what what it would be the chronology with the uh, index of growth ring widths for the period of 1923s to 2015 and all the uh, uh, signal or point 85 that indicates that they capture a signal a common signal in the graphs you can observe the part the shadowed area that we can observe precisely that the number of samples increased from 1950 uh, these are uh, records since 1920 and concerning the relation between the growth and climate there is a positive correlation with rains that start in october and the all completely the opposite with temperature there's a negative correlation and in fin Ending in the graph, we can see a index of growth and temperature, the growth in green and temperature in red with a correlation, negative correlation in minus 0.25. And here with rain, we can see that with the first rains with the rainy period from October to March. And here you see some images of all the activities that have been carried out in Yanidla. There are several endochronological areas, dendrochronological areas, both data processing that has been done with help of Ricardo, Maria Eugenia, and the Lidio. And we in, have in Bolivia a lab with basic equipment, but we need trained uh, staff to do the management. And my perspective as a professor is to replicate everything that I have learned in Mendoza with the means that I have here available with the students so that to continue this uh, track, tracking of this uh, data. And there are research that we are doing in coordination with Ricardo and con and with Libya to generate more information because one of the biggest problems in Bolivia is precisely the lack of motivation for research. And we do research many times with our own economic resources and to go to Mendoza is impossible. So thanks to the fellowship, I've been able to do all these activities that have helped me to uh, replicate this um, work in my university.
Thank you very much, Monica. That was very complete. Thanks, Matias and Monica. We now have a few minutes, I think, Juliana, I don't know how many, where we can start asking the audience, uh, I mean, the audience can ask the questions they wish of Matias and Monica. So the floor is open for discussion. And Monica spoke a little bit about the importance and the benefit of the fellowship for her for being able to travel. So, Matias, what do you think this fellowship allowed for you, which you wouldn't have been able to do? Can you tell us about your personal experience? Yes, in my experience, I had already been in Mexico, but I hadn't worked in the Institute of Biology. And in our laboratory, we are focused on studying interspecific studies. So the study of the university and the laboratory of Mateo Barona studies mainly the relations between the species and they have developed me analysis methods with huge databases, phylogenetical and spatial, which in our laboratory from the conceptual and the technical aspects, it where the analysis was extremely difficult. And as I said, we wish to make the leap from a region, the Atacama Desert and a species, a single species to a region, and then go to global patterns. And the connection with Santelli was really opened that conceptual possibility and then technical and analytical aspects that he taught me how to do it. He taught me to manage huge databases. I used to do it by hand very uh, domestically, we could say, and this has uh, allowed me a very important database that has been uh, shared very generously. And that was the most important thing to generate this relation that will open a lot of uh, research lines in the future. And obviously, that you have said a bit about it, but obviously these fellowships, you think that have been useful to generate this exchange and the, to, so that you have the importance, for the importance of being person in person in a lab and speak with people who have the know-how of the techniques that you wish to work on and to visit them and really have these invaluable experiences, especially in a context in um, uh, South America and the Caribbean, where we know that access to funding is very difficult for research. And we know about it, but please tell us about it, Monica, how this helped you to go to other labs. Yes. Completely, yes, in my case, it was a unique opportunity. I had received some funding, receiving fund, international funding allowed me to do work in a different way so concerning the paleoclimatic as issues that in Latin America uh, need new perspectives and see the effect of past climate on different aspects of biodiversity. And this has given us a possibility given by the scholar, by the fellowship that it, ha it is, has been very important for me to see how other labs focus on the, on the issue. And this has leveraged the my possibilities a lot. And what I liked about this fellowship that it was specific on this topic for a region to connect researchers along these lines. And I thought that was invaluable. Thank you very much for your clarification. And Monica, you're from Bolivia, you live there. Also, can you please tell us what it meant for you the, uh, to have the opportunity to go out of Bolivia and visit other labs and what are the capacities and capabilities that were enabled that you wouldn't have had in your country. Yes, precisely in the laboratory, we have very basic equipment, but we do not have 
trained staff to do the handling and the management and the equipment was just stored. And with this fellowship, I have been able to learn endochondrological techniques and the data processing aspects and also replicated with student and so to create and network, uh, knowledge network, so, and then I can connect with Lidio or with you, Maria Eugenia, to receive help on, sorry, it's with the research and it, they also give a lot of importance to academic aspects, sorry, but it's cutting off a bit. and to see the dynamics of how the lab manage, is managed. So there's a very small um, equipment that is very functional. We have a lot of equipment that is a very big carpentry shop, but it's not functional. And so this has allowed us to replicate these uh, experiences. Uh, I, I have become uh, enabled to replicate these uh, experiences. Julio, you can, Juliana, you can tell me because I don't know how much time we have for this. We have a few, more, four more minutes. So one thing that was extremely interesting, Matilde, uh, Matias and Monica, beyond the academic aspects, we think that this genera network generation and meeting people also give, has given you you more interpersonal opportunities. So to know about your experience concerning that and how it has been enriching for you to go to another laboratory in another country. Sure. Yes. For me, I had contacted Santiago in the middle of the pandemic a bit before the call in order to create a virtual connection and being able to be there actually in the in ter thanks to the fellowship we also participated in the congress in mexico we know how important the congress is and the all the talks and all the practice and that week that we were there it was very important and since i'm back I, we have continued with the research some uh, things can be fulfilled and others are not, but we are change the deadlines. But this creating this human connection and relationship, it has a lot has given us a lot of potential. And I'm trying to share with my colleagues in my laboratory and other laboratories in the Institute, this experience and this research network based on what I learned there, I hope and I believe that it will be founded on the human relation between researchers that we have created. And so this is very important, great. And Fabrice, would you like to make a question? Yes, I'd like to ask both of you I imagine that in your countries, you also have founding bodies, uh, uh, funding uh, uh, institutions that have money for scholarships. So I would like to ask, why did you choose to apply for this fellowship? And what, does, what makes it different from the ones that you already have access to in your funding? institutions in your country. What is the difference? Why would you apply for this fellowship and no other, not others that are available to you? Would you like to answer, Monica? Because I just spoke. Yes, here in Bolivia, there are very few opportunities. There's a policy where there are a lot of NGOs and foundations have closed, but there are some that fund only research, but the aspect of ability creation, capacity creation for scientists, this really is a plus of extra benefit of the pages fellowship. And also in addition to that, uh, and I had the in intention of applying to pages because even though Argentina is so close, they have so much experience. And in Bolivia, we do not have the people with these capacities. Sorry, it's cutting off a bit. And 
for example, in dendrochronology in Bolivia, we do not have people with these capacities and many of us precisely seek a co cooperation with Conicet and Yanila because they do have experience and they come to collect samples in our forest, which is limited for us. So the fellowship to me has been a huge support to generate a knowledge network and strengthen us, our relations with others. Shall I answer? Yes, in my case, Fabrizio, Fabrice, it has it's a similar. Even though there are uh, fellowships available in Argentina, but they are more focused on one side, which is mobility and pages allowed uh, traveling and other aspects. And so, this Argentina is a very difficult macroeconomic context, uh, which has made it impossible to cover a stay somewhere. So this was very important for me that I could pay uh, the stay and the tickets and different other aspects. And it was the the, the thematic aspect also that uh, motivated me to get connected and, and get to know the Institute and what they do, because I didn't know it. And this was a very important motivation for me. Great. Maybe we can take one more minute because there are a couple of questions. Uh, Romeo is asking or asking you what you can, uh, uh, types of uh, fields are covered by the fellowship. Uh, in my case, it was a three month period. It was very good. It was very intense. I the, and the scholarship covers every aspect, as I said, the ticket, the stay, there's also money for food and transportation. And in general, there is a very good agreement and the assistance that we received from pages was very good concerning organization, the economic balance, etc. Monica. It was almost two months, just four months short of four of two months, and uh, covered food, transportation, also internal transportation, and all the expenses, including the ins medical insurance, which was very important because I fell ill while there, and we also were in the middle of the pandemic. But one thing that I found remarkable because we do uh, uh, we have uh, to report all the expenses from photographs etc all very detailed expense uh, reporting and pages didn't have that uh, that I took a photo while making an, uh, an expense uh, so that gave me the freedom to make some expenses that may not be fixed in the budget so this made things much more easy and this so it was very gratifying to have this experience yes it is true that it is more flexible in terms of the expenses and this will allow you to cover more issues and the last question and it's a very small one that Felipe Matos is also from he's asking me if paleotempestology is part of the research lines that Pedro speaks, and maybe we can leave this for the end, but the mobility scholar, uh, fellowships in Latin America and the Caribbean, the Caribbean are focused on paleoclimatic research. So if you're 
research topic is connected with the research lines and the studies within pages, especially ver climate variability studies, you can, of course, apply for the fellowship. And it is important to go to the pages page uh, that Marisa showed, my friends showed, it has a lot of information and it's very easy to navigate it and you can see all the research lines that are being done not only in Latin America but all around the world. So we recommend very strongly that you check the page and you can see the areas that you can apply to and everything connected with paleo climate is welcome. Juli, would you like to um, go okay. to Juli, the so next let us now go on to the presenters. Researchers. You have the floor. Thank you, Matias and Monica. Thank you, Matias and Monica. Your experience was great. And as I am from South America as well, I've had the same experience. It's difficult to get the fellowship, and I'm so very happy to hear about your experience because it it's very encouraging. Now we will hear from the South American researchers. They represent uh, different uh, types of paleoclimate research. And they work with pages and the IAI as well. Each of you will have eight minutes to make your presentation. And after the presentations, we will open up the queue and a session for researchers. So first of all, Dr. Cristiano Chiesi, who is an associate professor at the School of Arts, Sciences and Humanities, University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Cristiano has experience in geoscience. He works with uh, paleoceanography and paleoclimatology especially in South America and the South Atlantic. Hi. Hello, everyone. It's a huge pleasure for me to be here and hear this fantastic experiences from Matthias and Monica. Um, OK, uh, thank you for the introduction, Juliana. Uh, I, and I hope this is OK to speak in English, because I'm afraid not to be understandable in my very rude and crude Spanish. Um, yes, um, this, I, 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 you know, I, I, in one sentence, I could say that this is a fantastic program. I enjoyed it so much when Pages designed it and, uh, and implemented it. Uh, but I have, a, I have a, a way more to say than that. Um, let me start by saying that in my view, and I think uh, many colleagues from the community share the same opinion, that past global changes is eminently a uh, multidisciplinary field of research. Uh, as uh, every multidisciplinary field of research, it is uh, obviously uh, uh, an advantage if you can network, if you can link with other groups uh, in which uh, different expertises are covered uh, so that you can eventually reach the necessary multidisciplinarity. In the best case, you reach this within uh, the group, but this is much more commonly done among different groups that get together and end up with different expertises. Um, yeah, so this is this is the first point. So past global, I think this is very important. Past global changes is eminently multidisciplinary and international. So there are, there are no borders. There are no borders into 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 the environments we investigate. There are no borders in the climate uh, 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 features we investigate. There are no borders in the oceanic circulation. Uh, uh, that you know, so so it it makes no sense to limit uh, past global changes to national boundaries or borders. So this is the second point in my view. And, and I'm pretty sure that many colleagues agree with this. Um, uh, so the second point is that Latin America uh, and, and the Caribbean, or so Latin American and Caribbean countries, they host already fantastic working groups 
I would say excellent working groups in um, many uh, uh, specific topics of past global changes. So we will find in different countries, this uh, 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 laboratories, working groups, uh, uh, dedicated to specific uh, topics of past global changes that indeed uh, have a, a very uh, um, advanced studies being done. Uh, but what is uh, a very important topic here is that mobility within these working groups is a historical bottleneck. Uh, it is in uh, specific countries of Latin America and the Caribbean, much easier to find funds to go to Europe or to the US or to say Australia and uh, yeah, other countries. But it is very hard to find specific funding schemes that will fund uh, mobility within the region. So it's not only a question of, okay, there are different programs for financing mobility, but it's, well, uh, in fact, which programs will indeed fund mobility within the region? And uh, uh, so I'm based in Brazil. I know very well the Brazilian landscape for uh, funding science, uh, not only projects, but also mobility. And I can ensure you that it's much easier to find scholarships to go to Europe, the US, Canada, uh, or Australia, for instance, uh, than to move to different South American or Caribbean countries. So this is uh, uh, obviously then a very important point. Um, so, uh, mobility and, and the exchange of experiences within this region is historically uh, uh, very localized. There are a few uh, fields of past global change research that for specific uh, uh, circumstances manage it to, to build, say, a continental scale uh, a community, but most of all the fields haven't done that. And you will, see, you will find uh, a much more robust, uh, say, uh, cooperation within specific groups from, say, Latin America and Caribbean, and this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, very, very uh, large uh, countries in terms of, of, of science they do uh, than within the region. So the PAGES um, IAI fellowship program fills in exactly this gap. Uh, and it's uh, therefore an extremely welcome mobility funding scheme um, that has been operating for two years, as we heard from, from Marcella, and uh, is now uh, going into its uh, third year. Um, I hope that this, this funding scheme will be sustained for long enough a period to indeed have uh, an effect uh, uh, over uh, uh, networking within Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, the community needs some time to first be made aware of this funding scheme and second to, to apply to it. I mean, if it, because it, it's a relatively new uh, program, the community uh, still, uh, uh, at least this is my opinion, need some time to, to, to be aware of it, need some time to, to learn the process of applying and to get used to this uh, funding scheme. So if the program can be sustained for long enough, I, I am pretty sure that it will be extremely positive for our past global changes communities. Um, as I mentioned before, there are excellent groups in different fields, but we have to connect people within Latin America and Caribbean. But um, don't understand me wrong. With this, I don't want to say that I, I don't see as relevant to send people and to bring people from US, Canada, Europe, Australia to Latin America and Caribbean or from Latin America and Caribbean to these places. I, I'm sure this is extremely relevant, 
but we can also learn a lot and do a lot within this, let's say, continental wide region. And it is much cheaper and it may be culturally also very effective. Yes, that's it for my side for the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Cristiano. I will be uh, saying this at the end of the presentations. Now I would like to invite Dr. Franz Sorry, this is Dr. Just a minute, please. I would like to invite Dr. Francisco. He's a professor at the Geoscience Institute, University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. He works in paleoclimatology based on the geochemistry of different regions in Brazil. Welcome, Chico. Hello, Juliana. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to talk to you here today. I'll try and speak English because my Spanish is limited as well. Thank you for the invitation. It's the first time I speak before this organization and conference. I'm very happy to talk to you. And it's also a pleasure to make a presentation about the work we do in Brazil. And we're also working with growth rings. Many of the students work with uh, Eugenia the Conicet with growth rings. And here we also have a, a laboratory to analyze these rings. Um, I would also like to talk about uh, what Cristiano said about having South American students in Sao Paulo, especially at the University of Sao Paulo. We only have eight minutes. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, but for now it's kind of black. So I'm not sure if you're sharing something for now. Or is it just with me? I don't know. It's coming, I think. It's coming? Yeah. I mean, it's it about was. to. <laughs> okay. Now, it's okay? Yes, yeah. Good. Um, here in Sao Paulo, I'm coordinating a, a group. Uh, Chico, just one second. Can you uh, put it like full screen? Because for now, we just see okay. the PowerPoint diagram. Um, you can screen sharing. Um, unfortunately, I'm I mean, you already using full screen. Maybe, maybe I'm not sure you're sharing the different screen from the screen that there is the full screen. Because right now we just see PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah. I try to do that again. I hope this time it works. Not quite, but maybe if you just zoom, use the PowerPoint just to zoom in, it will be fine. Is it okay now? Because I'm seeing the full screen in my... Uh, but I guess you're sharing different screens. So maybe, can you go back to your PowerPoint where you see the, the panel and everything? Yeah, great. And then there, this is the screen that uh, is being shared. So that's what we are seeing now. Mm -hmm. yep. You can carry this to the other screen. I guess it will be fine. I, there is only one screen here. Sorry. Okay, so maybe it's <laughs> like oh, the, yeah. the down part over there. Maybe I can pass my word to other people. I can convert everything in PDF. 
So it might be a problem of PPT of PowerPoint. File. And just like what, what about if you put the presentation mode? It is it is in presentation mode, like full screen presentation mode. I do, yeah. What about now? The same no. problem. <laughs> yeah, but I have an idea. Do you see where you just click it to put it in full screen? Just on the right side, there is this zoom. Just zoom, use it this zoom, and then I guess it'll be fine. Yeah, 200% or something like that. Yeah. It's now 50%. <laughs> if you put it like a little bit larger, it's going to be okay. Um, zoom screen. Uh, Chico, no, se você for no PowerPoint, sabe onde você apertou para poder virar a apresentação? Do ladinho tem um troço, um negócio de colocar zoom. Ali do ladinho, era só arrastar. É, deixa eu tentar aqui, Juliana. Estou começando tudo de novo do PowerPoint, né? Mas eu acho que estou atrasando muito todo mundo. Eu vou... É... So, I think we can uh, just... Can you send us the, the PPT? You can send to my email. Maybe you have it or, I don't know, to someone here. I will send you in the in the chat my email and then we I can I think I still have time. your email. You know? It's a long time. Yeah. I don't talk to you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'll pass the word to Catalina and then I go back sure. to you. Sure. Go ahead, Catalina, please. Is that okay? Okay, yep. so now we present, uh, sorry. Uh, I'd like to introduce Catalina. Catalina Gonzalez Arango is an associate professor at the Department of Biological Sciences at Universidad de los Andes in Colombia. She leads a research group in tropical paleoecology and palynology to study long-term paleoecological, paleoclimatic history of tropical ecosystems from northern, southern, northern South America due to the interactions among human societies, climate changes, and and geologic pro, uh, processes. Catalina, are you there? Catalina, you have the floor. Okay, we might go to um, <laughs> Claudia, está lista, sí. uh, Claudia. Ah, okay. there we have Catalina. I think she was having some coffee. No, I wasn't. I'm here. I'm here. Okay, then Catalina has the floor and we'll hear from Claudia later on. Okay. Thank you for the invitation. I am very happy to be here today. And this is truly important to me because Pages has uh, helped me in my career. When, when I was a graduate student, then in, uh, in my master's degree and in my PhD. Uh, and even as a you know longer standing researcher, I'm very happy to share this, and they have helped me as well. I'm happy to happy to be here with my colleagues. We've grown together in this process, and this clearly shows us that networking networks are necessary, functional, and that it's truly important to support these initiatives as led by the IIM pages. I lead a tropical palynology and paleoecology lab in the tropical forest of uh, Colombia. I've done this for almost uh, 13 years, and this is a relatively small but very active group. It's a highly multidisciplinary group as well. I wanted to share with you uh, our lab's website. Here you can see several sites um, where we have worked, Colombia, South America. In each site, we have uh, implemented various methods and techniques, not just polar, but also charcoal, geochemistry, fossil woods, and we need to remember that woods are increasingly important in South America, given their potential. There, we have several uh, research lines. 
some in uh, paleo climate, paleo environments, also historical ecology. We work with archaeologists to connect paleo scales uh, to recent systems. I, and also my passion in the last few years has been working uh, on geologically dynamic systems such as uh, volcanoes. And also I have worked with ecology and paleoecology and in volcanic areas and also the connection between climate, geology and biodiversity. And recently, and this is quite intimate, but the case has been that a good experiment uh, has been a good experiment to try to connect other disciplines and other knowledges and techniques to communicate the science that we do especially con working the connection between art and science uh, with some very enriching dialogues to further enrich the transmission of scientific knowledge to civil society and society at large. And so there's a short presentation where I wanted to highlight the power and the opportunity that I see in these funding systems. And clearly the world is moving toward the, the, for those that, not only for those of us that are experts that guide or train other less expert or ones such as students, uh, but the world is moving towards peer-to-peer -to -peer collaboration. So this is a wonderful uh, opportunity for students to get trained with other students and to formalize the networks that will go be there for them during their whole professional life. And as Cristiano said, we are in multidisciplinary disciplines and there are cross-cutting issues that require to being connected and uh, these inter integrating studies that imply a lot of sites, different realities, different techniques, with need of meeting situations. And this is where we think that this opportunity with these types of funding uh, enable that. And in Latin America, there are excellent labs. We don't need to go to Europe or the US. In Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, there are excellent facilities, technical facilities it is a lot of times it's much easier to uh, transport samples and concrete examples from my professional life, my micro CT scans and the XRF, the fire, the isotopes labs and ICPMS microscopy, etc. All of these labs are available in Latin America and it's much easier to use them because they are nearby. And we have for some proxies such as pollen, uh, pollen or fit to do or wood, the reference collections are extremely important and we do need these local re reference collections. So it is extremely interesting to uh, think about enriching and visiting these uh, reference collections. And we know that in graduate programs, we have sometimes the obligation to go uh, away for a semester and in these graduate programs this fellowship would enrich the graduate programs that we have to be so they become more sound and the fact that we share languages and cultures that are similar in Latin America the Caribbean makes it much more easy to in become integrated culturally to really absorb in a very real and uh, in, in, in way and in a short time, uh, an international experience. And the, in very short stays, if you're going to be just for a month in the US, you will spend the whole month trying to understand the language. So in Latin America, this becomes much more easily and it flows and becomes a very enriching experience from day one. So, and we cannot, we shouldn't forget that we have some challenges, obviously the climate change crisis is 
the core of our discussions in Latin America, and many times we need to think about the problem is local, but the solutions must be um, seen regionally. And so we have to think as a region, and these funding schemes are extremely important, and we need to start to try to connect Palio to see how it is a tool to inform all these solutions of conservation, restoration, management for ecosystems, how we will conserve, and Palio is a unique opportunity for our disciplines to really connect with the first line issues worldwide. And one thing that I shouldn't forget is that our main richness in Latin America is biodiversity and our people. And the fact that we really have to reinforce this and having access to sampling sites, what Monica was mentioning a minute ago about her example of the dry forests and our ecosystems to go to the field, monitor the systems. This is an incredible strength that many times we will not have if we go outside Latin America. So these are great huge opportunities, but as it has been mentioned, there are some particular situations, funding in Latin America is extremely difficult and increasingly so with the huge financial crisis where the labs that have already been established, the professors ourselves have funding difficulties. We have difficulties for visiting. Uh, the, I've been wanting to visit Chico for three years and I haven't been able to because there is no money available. So extending the funding, not only for PhD candidates and postdocs, but in our countries, the pre-graduate uh, uh, students, the master's candidates would be great to give them possibilities for moving and for professors, we would appreciate small grants to initiate collaboration so that more students can share and in the future these opportunities. We have fewer students who want to study science and who want to um, go into academics, it's more difficult to attract them. So how can we make it science, value of science attractive so that we can have the dynamics and for our laboratories uh, to prevent our laboratories from dying for lack of interest. And in Latin America, we have huge gaps and huge heterogeneity in gender, in languages, in minority groups with very limited access to resources. So these types of funding will help close those gaps and we should include it in to, uh, to help these uh, close these gaps. And so there are some proposals of how we, what else we can fund with these schemes and this can be left for our discussion at the end so that it's not just a one one-on-one -on -one schemes for one student to move to one lab, but um, other programs or, or that include more collaborative projects for more people or spaces for education. We can talk about that later, but this is basically what I have to share with you. Thank you very much, Catalina. And yes, during the discussion, it will be extremely important and we can share that uh, uh, slide later again. And now, Chico, are you there? Can you go? Uh, no, you're not there. Uh, yes, something has happened with his internet, I think. So now we'll give the floor to Claudio. Claudio de la Torre is a teacher of the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. Claudio is interested in understanding the complex long-term relationship between climate, vegetation, and human history in arid and semi-arid environments. Okay, thank you very much. 
Juliana, and I'd like to thank the invitation of IAI to participate in this webinar. To me, for me, it's a pleasure to be here. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it perfectly. Great. Okay, I would like to... I would like to tell you about what we have been doing the last few years and the lab of paleoecology and paleoenvironments that I uh, manage in the University of Chile, Universidad de Chile, and also the Laboratory of Biochemical Chemistry and Isotopes, Applied uh, Stable Isotopes, La Basi. It's a lab. Okay. It's a, this laboratory is an interdisciplinary lab, as many of our colleagues have highlighted. The, the nature is to work with of working in paleoecology and paleoenvironment. There's a definition of this seminar. One of our own focus uh, points of focus is understanding the changes of the arid and semi-arid environments and the impact on human societies, flora and fauna, in the last glacial era to the present. So this is some of the projects in our lab, one of the efforts that we have been working on for eight years, precisely through with the help of the Chilean government with Ponicid is understanding the environmental change and the prehistoric occupation of the coastline. And this photo is in the Cochale, uh, archaeological site with a lot of cultural material uh, that will uh, help us understand the prehistoric occupation of the coastline, but also it is all a big source of environmental wealth because there's a basis of the exploitation of the resources uh, depends on the uh, uh, evolution in the past. So there's a connection between paleoecology and uh, we, are, we are working on is the variability of the and the composition of isotopic changes, especially of hydrogen, hydrogen, and this is associated with the current materials, for example, the connected with the cultural patterns associated and uh, have been that basically uh, cover the Atacama Desert has preserved this material in an incredible manner. Another aspect that we are working on has to do with paleoecology and climate variability in the Pampa del Tamarugal, which is in the north of Chile, and this basin was much more diverse and it has a much more complex system with the recharge of aquifers and rainwater and it has a megafauna and flora from the end of the Pleistocene and now we are developing in a very active manner connected with the current climate change as the drought patterns in Chile has to do with the varia climate variability, especially focused in the last few decades, but especially comparing the last few decades of climate variability, especially in Chile, which we where we have a mega drought, especially concerning with the last millennia and the previous millennia. And Another the funding, I don't know how it was funded because it's trying to understand how the fog behaved in the past. The fog has an important atmospheric component and what we will try is to create a record, record a log of the desert of Atacama with the bioproxies of the fog in the past, especially because there's a lot of interest in understanding fog, especially with the 
potential source of fresh water, especially in coastal communities. And this, there's, we're working with a lot of colleagues from all over the world, the variability of coastal forest, and also the diversity, variability, and mechanisms of adaptation of the flora in the Atacama Desert. And we are implementing a laboratory of paleogenomics and paleometabolomics for which is open for potential collaborations. And this is just an example of what we have been doing in the lab. And this is a study that where we use the uh, corridors that are formed in the desert that re enable reconstructing ecological variability with a lot of precision. This study specifically used the species of uh, rodents. And we know that the respond to precipitation, to rainfall, and this is the annual. And we use their feces to rebuild the uh, rainfall in the last 14,000 years in the desert of Atacama. So this is has been done by a doctorate um, candidate doctoral candidate that finished his degree recently. Another study is, has been headed, spearheaded by Francis, Dr. Francisca Diaz that has been used in uh, the multi-scale climate change impacts on plant diversity in the Atacama Desert to compare the flora uh, using a polling analysis and others for this purpose. And what she showed was that this works very well, especially based basically uh, based on certain specimens of plants that are found in the desert and comparing that with the current composition of plants. And in that case, we have shown different temporal uh, correlations and how the flora is affected by climate changes, and except for the changes at the end of the Pleistocene, this uh, flora is quite resilient. And I would like to highlight this paleo DNA study because the paleo DNA not only is useful for replicating more tradition, the traditional aspects such as variations in flora, but it also serves to explore new aspects such as parasite load, which is present, and also the load of phytopathogens such as fungi that are present, things that you could not be able to see in the, with the traditional tools, with more traditional tools. So it is a new tool that really helps us to reconstruct past ecosystem change in that would not be um, obvious by like looking at pollen or other previous methods. So I would like to finish this presentation. I agree with what Catalina sa uh, said, and I think her uh, presentation was much more complete concerning the opportunities for change and improvement that we have uh, uh, for progressing with the paleo sciences in the future. I think that the challenge of funding is fun fundamental and seeking collaborations and new opportunities is the key because I can see just as Catalina said that the funding sources in each of our countries have shrunk in a considerable manner in spite of all the policies for that uh, they, uh, there are this being discussed that it should increase, but this is a long way away. So these are just examples of opportunities of collaboration that we have worked on. We are currently carrying out several projects with international collaboration, NSF, in the USA, and we are also have a long uh, collaboration with Spain, with Link Global, 
program turning climate change to develop records of past ecological environmental change in northern and central Chile. Our lab is also part of the effort of a working group in pages. So assembling working groups in pages is also a very important tool that should be taken in these uh, collaborations. A multidisciplinary group of researchers that seeks to find the peopling of the earth over uh, understand the peopling of the earth over the last 3000 years and we are seeking collaborations to form network seeing paleodemographic changes, etc. So obviously, from my point of view, the, the collaborations that I would like to develop within the IAI and pages is to increase our understanding of the recent evolution and the recent past during the Pleistocene of the arid ecosystems of Latin America. So I think that there's a lot of things that can so be done. So there's a lot also. of things we can do, but this means that we might work to get together with different laboratories and have actually an interaction network. Pages has done something, uh, did something amazing uh, 10 years ago. They held uh, low trade meetings in South America. These are P2K, Pages 2K initiatives. These were great meetings because they focused on uh, Latin American researchers, those of us working with paleo science. So it was an open size meeting organized by Pages, but with a South American and Latin American focus. It would be truly positive to develop that type of event uh, with the cooperation of the IAI and PAGES, for instance. That would be very positive. Uh, also, we need to make the most of this cooperation opportunity to develop networks that would allow us to have the necessary funds and expertise uh, of, for instance, to have a core facilities database um, so that we know which the core facilities are in Latin America, where we have the labs, the, you know, the basic skills we need, and they would allow us to um, implement our research projects collaboratively. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. I think Chico is now ready. Uh, I'd like to share my screen now. I can see this screen. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Juliana. Juliana, right? <laughs> okay, I'll be speaking Spanish. Creo que vou falar inglês. Prefiro falar inglês. Desculpa. Então, acá em Brasil, temos you have a network of researchers, and this project here, the pilot project, is a five years funded project by FAPESP in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and NSF in the United States, and also have a collaboration with Argentinians from Nia Nigla. Okay, so you have that. Uh, please pass to the next one, please. Yeah, uh, here in Brazil, um, you don't have everything in the same lab. So you need to collaborate with other lab and other professors and other groups to uh, make um, the data acquisition for researchers more complete. For example, here in Sao Paulo, you have um, Spilotem uh, lab, like, and you have um, stable uh, facilities to, to run samples uh, like carbonates, but you are um, now um, able to analyze samples for um, uh, three rings um, cellulose, okay? And you can also uh, run samples for um, organic matter, for example, for nitrogen, for sulfur, and for carbon, organic matter in, 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 in sediments, in, in lake sediments, marine sediments, and other um, kind of samples. And you have this collaboration with dendrochronologists, for example, Professor Mario Tomasiello, um, Gregorio Secantini, 
Uh, Mark Fuzesi, he is from the chemistry department. He has a laser ablation and he could help also using the laser ablation for wood, uh, for example, and also for some other samples. And uh, me and Nicholas Strix uh, he, and other uh, people from the lab, Giselle Utida, you are now um, going from different scales in, in the work on stable isotopes. And you also collaborate uh, with modelers, modelers in Brazil, like Juvan Sampaio at INPI, but also modelers from um, other institutes um, around the world. Please, next one, Juliana. Yeah, uh, it, as you can see here, you have um, a quite big number of students. Some of these students are from other countries in South America. For example, you have postdocs like Veronica Hamiri, she's from Colombia. Uh, here um, below uh, Veronica, you have uh, Angela Ampuero from Peru, and uh, like Melissa Medina. Uh, Martins Medina, she's from Colombia too. So you have a, a connection of uh, labs and also you uh, have this uh, possibility to, um, to offer some fellowships, Brazilian fellowships of foreign students. Unfortunately, you don't have money here in Brazil from FAPESP to invite students from other labs in South America, in Argentina, or in Chile, or in Peru, in Ecuador, in Colombia, to come to here to spend our time. So this kind of fellowships offered by PAGES in IAA is very important to, to make this, this possible, make this, this possible to have this network of uh, not only a research, but students, uh, especially graduate students. Next one. Uh, yes, um, all those students here is now is 40, 40 people uh, engaged in the project. They have uh, Brazilian fellowships. Uh, most of them are from FAPESP, which is this uh, Sao Paulo State Science Foundation. So all, all this work is funded by FAPESP, Sao Paulo State Science Foundation. But you also have other kinds of fellowships from governor, federal government. Next one. Next one, please, Vienna. Yes, I can go, pass, can pass. Pass, pass, yeah. Uh, what you can do here, you have been done some monitoring program, uh, like uh, setting up uh, isotope station here to a measure uh, rainfall isotope composition, uh, cave water uh, isotope composition. Sometimes these stations are also useful for people who are doing, uh, for example, studies on uh, three rings stable isotopes. Okay, you can take that and all other kind of proxies. Uh, you are uh, now um, able to to run this uh, stable isotopes in cellulose, as I, I mentioned before. So you have collaboration from um, other institutes and professors are sending students to here, but uh, most of students are still Brazilians. So you need this help to bring students from other countries they, if they are interested in coming to Brazil. And, uh, and yeah, and uh, our main goal here is um, working on sputum records. Uh, you have records covering the last millennium left 2K in very high resolution, but you can also go beyond in time to the last 600,000 years. And, and also uh, you are uh, aiming to do kind of uh, reconstruction of hydroclimate in South America in, in continental scale. And you also have a close collaboration, for example, with Polish Chanographer, for example, Professor Cristiano Chiesi, have this close collaboration so we can compare marine records, lake records with spilotems and, and depends on the scales, um, could be also three rings. Next one, please. Juliana. Juliana, next, next one, please. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yes, this is a picture of Sao Paulo uh, University, Universidade de Sao Paulo is um, one of the most prestigious in, in Latin America, and one of the largest in Brazil. Uh, and uh, you have FAPESP, which is an island in Brazil, I can tell you that, because most of the uh, funding is coming from Sao Paulo State, it's not coming from federal government. What, what makes our facilities uh, 
like uh, more uh, complete in terms of uh, compared to other universities in Brazil. Next one, please. Yeah, this is a picture of Geoscience Institute. I'm based at Geoscience Institute. I'm a professor here. Um, next one. And these are our facilities. You have um, on the right, um, you see the facilities you have. You have a fully equipped uh, laboratory with three uh, mass packs uh, running for spilotems, carbonates, uh, water, uh, organic matter, and uh, also cellulose. You, you now uh, extract the cellulose from three rings. You separate that in, in a lab and run for oxygen and uh, carbon. Next one. Yes. Uh, yeah, Brazil is, is a country with uh, many beautiful caves. And uh, you have caves not only in, in Brazil, but in South America, in uh, countries like Peru and Colombia and Venezuela. Uh, they are, th these countries are rich in caves. So uh, if there are any professors or students who are interested in, in starting a work in, uh, work on spilotem from caves in your countries, please, uh, you are uh, very happy to talk about possible collaboration. Next one, Juliana. Uh, one minute. Okay, uh, so these are the this uh, cave and three ring sites have been collaborated in within the South America continent. Next one. Yeah, uh, these are example of long records uh, here on the, on the right panel. You can compare these records from Brazil, from South America with records, for example, in Asia. Uh, they, the Chinese, they, they could reconstruct the Chinese monsoon during the last six glacial, interglacial periods. Now you are doing the same as the Chinese did in Asia. Okay, doing that for South America using spilotems. Next one, Juliana. Yeah, but you also have some samples that goes back the last one, 1, um, um, 1,000 years in very high resolution. And some of these records, for example, this record from Central Brazil shows a, a trend that resembles the global warming trend. Next one. <clears throat> And uh, this area, for example, in Peruaçu Valley, I think Eugenia knows the area, uh, is affected, impacted by um, multi-decadal droughts. And those multi-decadal droughts is impacted by global warming because the um, uh, warming here is above the global average. And you can feel that in these pilotems as well. Next one. This is um, a stream flow records showing that rivers are um, losing uh, like discharge with during the last uh, three, four decades. Next one. And you have this um, records shows that this drought in uh, central Brazil has no precedent during the last 1000 years. You can feel, uh, discuss that based on the stable isotopes and trace elements. And this, this slide, next one, please, Juliana. This slide is just to show that I uh, have the first papers came out in the literature with the data, stable isotope data of the three rings producing in our lab. Okay, uh, for example, Daiga uh, Ricardo uh, Rodriguez Ortega, he is Peruvian and he did uh, all his uh, analysis here in our lab, and uh, those results are not are now being published in, in some good papers in the literature. Next one, Juliana. Yeah, in, and you're also interested in doing the outreach activities. I know uh, that uh, some projects are interesting in and show uh, the scientific key works to local people. Um, next one, Juliana. And also, you also um, being part of some permanent exhibitions in some uh, national parks in Brazil. 
uh, to try to make this connection between science, university, and local people. So is, uh, there is a room also for people uh, who wants to do some outreach here in Brazil. Next one, Juliana. I hope it's getting, yeah. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about our work. Thanks, everybody, for your presentations. And now we will open the space for questions. We have some in the chat, but I will first make a presentation because a little while ago I was talking with some researchers in South America and what you were saying about the collaboration within South America between labs was a big part of the discussion and what we are saying about having the collaboration within South America. This exchange of students within South America is extremely important because there is the aspect of expenses that are lower, but if we also think that of the impact of CO2, it will also be important. And another thing that is that we don't, if we have South America, we do not have to travel to Europe or to the US and we can stay in the continent doing the exchange, not only with students, but also sending sampling for an, samples for analysis in labs. And we have had some examples such as the lab of Dr. Claudio, the, uh, this collaboration and this opportunity Unity that the fellowship fellow pages IAI fellowship gives us is very important to make these links stronger between institutions as a Brazilian student. I'm in Prague now, but when I was, had the opportunity in Brazil to ha do an exchange outside, all of most of the cases were for Europe. But man, we know in South America, which are the best methods that work for our ecosystems. And South America is not only complex with cultures and people and countries, but also in terms of the different climatic aspects. We have the westerlies and we have the intersect and we have the centers of high pressure and we have resurgence and the Nino, La Nina, and we have so many complex uh, factors that we could just stay be between us, among us, and not closing ourselves to the world, but reinforcing this, this relation. So this is not a question, but something that I felt in what you said, and I had also felt that, and I felt it also as we were talking, even with Mary France, trying to find a network of collaboration between labs and have a list saying my lab has this, this equipment and we can do these labs at this and we can ex we can do this type of research and do an exchange uh, so like a database that we could all access to have this information and so the first question that i should make for everyone one, all, all the presenters of this block is how this type of fellowship helps build com community. We were talking about collaboration and the creation of network networking. I will try to speak in Spanish, and if you don't understand me, please just let me know. So, networks are the natural result of this fellowship, no doubt. Because if we send a student for a couple of months to a close a lab close by, it's natural that they will come back, and naturally the network will be established and it's extremely effective 
the cultural barriers are not as large as sending somebody to a country with a different language, different cultural aspects. And also one of the objectives of the program is that it so is extremely effective and the, it's an expected result outcome of this program. Yes, precisely. And the next topic that I would like to discuss, and we have started already to speak because the next question is the, what Cristiano said about the, scholar, the fellowship program that is extremely necessary so that we have an impact in the long term. And in addition to that, we also ha are thinking about what else we can implement in the program. For example, I had a question like, if you had a magic wand that you could use it to create, a program where you don't have to think about budget limits, what would you create? And I think that we could start the discussion with the slide that Catalina showed. If you, Catalina, if you could share it again, please. Sorry, this was not considered a magic wand, um, but uh, yes, um, if I had, uh, you know, the necessary resources and had no uh, barriers, I think that the experience on the ground is truly important and the networks uh, consolidate if we are able to share a few days uh, around uh, an issue, you know, having a group of people from different uh, disciplines to share uh, work on the ground. And I think that is truly effective. And this, uh, and people tend to remember this quite a lot. So maybe I would um, suggest some courses, for instance. I was just talking to Ivan, we were thinking about the Urbino Paleo Climate School you know, some sort of um, experiential work where we can visit different regions in Latin America, where we can visit the labs. Of course, the, the funds are limited and we can't um, help everyone uh, travel, but the, uh, the Lautrec meetings were very important and they really boosted the Latin America and Caribbean uh, communities. So having, you know, working many laboratories and people working around uh, common topics is a great strategy. Would you like to say something about that, Cristiano? I think that we need to conduct uh, uh, more detailed research studies as in Colombia, Argentina, etc. And these conferences made by Catalina are important because we can map a way to help um, undergraduate and graduate students as well. And it would be a very positive um, uh, strategy. The fellowships are truly important to help uh, researchers visit other laboratories in their own country or other countries such as Brazil, Argentina, and Chile. So we need to, and we need to consider Mexico as well as a place where they have great laboratories. And we need to map the, these studies. This is our priority, or should be a priority in conferences. Thank you. Cristiano, you can go ahead. Okay. 
Uh, yo, uh, I think that many will agree that uh, funds are insufficient in several Latin American and Caribbean countries to research past global changes. So, uh, some funds are available, and this these funds will surely lead to the expected outcomes. However, if uh, funds were have been insufficient for a long time, uh, we need to make an effort regarding past global changes. And actually, um, this might take a long time. This is why I said in my brief presentation that it's important to sustain this program over time, or for longer at least, so that we can uh, get the uh, reach the expected outcomes. Yes, I truly agree. I think that each country has specific um, uh, guidelines regarding funding. And it, it's always difficult to travel abroad. And I agree that we need to foster cooperation uh, within our countries. In my field, uh, a lot of effort has been, uh, a lot of progress has been made in the last um, 50, 10 to 15 years. And this was possible thanks to this type of large project and also thanks to these scholarships so that um, researchers could uh, visit different laboratories. It's always very useful to travel, of course. And we also need to consolidate labs and uh, the cooperation among Latin American countries. This is very important in order to uh, make progress. Sometimes we, we are behind other regions. And I can say this from my discipline. And this is a case generally, I think. So I agree, Cristiano. Um, I think this is essential so that interaction um, consolidates and so that other people uh, can uh, focus on paleoclimate as a scientific discipline. Um, I think that we can uh, have this as a main takeaway, and this uh, was very clear from our conversation. We um, are going to implement another program in this regard. Catalina talked about a summer course, for instance. Uh, also field trips, which might be useful so that we can visit other sites in South America. Anything else that you would like to consider? I was thinking about smaller uh, scholarships to conduct analysis. For instance, when you need to date a sample, conduct an isotopic analysis, and you send the samples to the United States and Europe. Uh, however, in Latin America now we have several facilities. Uh, Claudio was talking about the facilities in his university. My university also has major core facilities, also in Mexico and Sao Paulo. So maybe we should, uh, you know, improve the analytical capacity of the region with small scholarships. Maybe we don't need mobility programs all the time. I remember that when I was starting out, it was very difficult to get funds to date samples, C14, etc. And I remember that the Arizona State University uh, was granting small uh, scholarships for dating purposes. I don't know, $3,000 for dating, $2,000 for isotopes, etc. So these are several analytical techniques. Many times they don't require mobility, which would be ideal, but at least our laboratories are considered as uh, of great scientific quality. And therefore we can also have analytical 
ámbito analítico. Collaboration. And, and also for smaller projects, we need preliminary, preliminary data when we have a, a, an undergraduate dissertation or something like that. Maybe they, these are not huge projects, but they allow us to create the network. So these scholarships are also useful. And we need to remember that researchers uh, lack the necessary funds as well. So we might also use seed grants. And, you know, I want to talk to Claudio after this talk, Cristiano, Chico, so that to see if we can maybe work together for a week on a project. You know, that type of thing, I think it might be useful. But of course, uh, resources are finite, so we need to prioritize. Okay, we need to finish in two minutes. Claudia and Chico would like to say something. One minute each. Very briefly, I think that a very effective specific collaboration mechanism is what Catalina said. Maybe a small fund to support analysis and also a small fund to create a databases of the uh, laboratories we have in Latin America and also a support fund so that they can um, the laboratories can analyze different samples as a very specific and inexpensive uh, tool. Thank you. Catalina, I think that in three to six month time, it's, it's possible to conduct uh, isotope analysis or even on, on growth rings, etc. And small scholarships, yes, minimum three months, maximum six months, in order to help to provide more opportunities with this, uh, more students with the same opportunity so that we can share the resources with a larger number of students. Thank you. Thank you, Chico. We have one more minute and Catalina wanted to answer a question someone asked in the chat. Do you do this, Catalina? Here there's a question. And Catalina and someone else said that how it's possible to create a, a network to strengthen communities in the South American region, Latin America and the Caribbean. And they were also talking about these courses that can be organized, graduate, postgraduate training workshops that might include several disciplines and that are truly interesting so that we can meet people from other disciplines and, pre, uh, and do networking as well. Kata, you were saying this. Uh, it's basically the same thing we were saying. There are already examples around the world. You know, we can borrow some course ideas to see how we can complement them. There are very uh, well-established courses. There are other courses in the area of conservation biology, for instance, in Costa Rica, they've worked for decades and very well, so we can learn from them. But clearly this entails a different type of commitment uh, and uh, funding. So we need to say that the paleo discipline needs to uh, become valid and relate to other disciplines that are important nowadays. So uh, climate change, of course, but also conservation, restoration of carbon cycles, etc. Paleo should participate with other disciplines so that we can justify the fact that we're important as well, that the world needs us. So the idea is to, you know, leave our comfort zone, you know, paleo is talking to paleos, that's fine, okay, uh, for, for to be, to train. But we need to be exposed to other types of discourse, and we need to say why paleo uh, disciplines are important as well. Finally, we need to remember uh, undergraduate and, uh, and 
master's degree students, not just, you know, uh, PhD students. So I think we should include them in uh, maybe smaller funding schemes, funding schemes, but we should include them as well. Yes, that's truly important. Well, clearly we need to have a, another workshop or a meeting in order to uh, develop these ideas, which are very interesting. Uh, but we have to go for now. Thank you, everyone, for sharing your experiences with us. And now I would like to give the floor to Marie France, the Executive Director of Pages. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Juliana. Well, we don't have much time and I will not talk you, long Juliana, now. Well, um, we don't have much time and just starting with the end, thanking, now. thank um, you everyone. That's the most important. The thank you. Thank well, maybe for you, also everyone. for the translator who did a great job thank and uh, to, to all the participants for attending, for the IEI to organize it. And uh, thank you to you, Juliana and uh, Eugenia for, for leading us through this discussion. And uh, a big thanks for for the, to the speakers who who bring brought their experience on the importance of the fellowship, the importance of the networking uh, from the the fellows who had the, the chance to to take part in in this mobility. How they feel it is important to to get in touch to, to have human contact with uh, with people, human connection also to to bring that experience back home uh, in their own uh, own uh, environment also i heard from uh, the the more senior participants um, well the difficulties in south america to get some uh, connections and some fellowships or some mobility grants for within south america but on the other hand how, how much it is important so also many other things and uh, related to who can be funded for the the long-term view or how to to create a community within south america so as uh, juliana said i think uh, south america well, this was an interesting conversation, but um, most probably we will need well, more to to really set up something to to do something that is useful for all of you. And uh, well, trying first of all to continue this uh, this fellowship. So with that, uh, Marcela, if you want to add something, up to you. So with that, Marcela, if you want to add something, up to you. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Marie France. Uh, well, I will Three closing to... remarks. This was a very successful uh, webinar. First of all, thank you, everyone, especially the fellows who have been here with us sharing their experience. Also, to the other panelists for sharing not just the importance of research and networks, training, and also. Um, they talked about how we can continue working. They have shared new ideas and they have told us how we can support young uh, early career research and also um, science in the region. Thank you to the facilitators, to the chairs. You've done an amazing job. And thank you to the organizers, including my team here at the IAI. Also, we shouldn't underestimate the power of networks uh, and also we need students, sci sci senior researchers and early career researchers as well. We need multinational, multidisciplinary, multi-institutional networks. We need to include several universities, laboratories and academicians that work in different countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. And they don't always have the opportunity to share not just training, but also staff, staff expertise, methodologies, and uh, data banks. And also, it's necessary to identify the challenges, for instance, funding, data, lack of human resources to uh, work now and in the future. Therefore, we need to better explore cooperation networks. 
um, we can expand the use. I think it's very important for us to reflect and find ways to provide more support to the networks and their participants and their participants. Third, many people have talked regarding funding. We need funding to have more mobility fellowships that will provide yeah, Elikara researchers and young students this unique opportunity to travel outside their country so that they can see what is being done in other institutions and countries. The idea is for them to talk to their peers and other disciplines and other experts, and also to observe which challenges are common in several countries, um, so that they can see that there are opportunities and they can make the most of them as well. Uh, many of you know that there is great difficulty, not just limited resources, but also many resources cannot go beyond national borders. Many times uh, they cannot even go beyond state uh, borders. Therefore, we need innovative mechanisms that can provide uh, further research, training, mobility opportunities. But also a consortium that can use resources beyond the borders, national or provincial. So it's a multiple exercise, not only of expertise and data, but also concerning funding and governance of the funding. And I would also like to mention that the IAI and other existing consortia that work with the Pepsi Conisat know about the issue. These are international resources and they are members. So how to find mechanisms that can enable funding and can be the money club that brings the, to the institution and their researchers and the brings together the discipline, different disciplines through activities and projects and programs. And I think that these are challenges for a future brainstorming that we could organize between pages and IAI to see what is it what is it, is it possible to do sometimes with limited resources that we all have a lot can be done with few resources and I think that Latin America and the Caribbean we are quite creative to make good use of limited resources with very little capacities but a lot of interest and a lot of knowledge and I think that uh, it, for fostering pro uh, seed projects, visit projects, that could, there could be a combination of projects and programs and activities that have these views uh, for training, networking, and improving the collaboration between the region's professionals. And I'm ending with this. Thank you very much, all of you. It's been a pleasure to be with you the last two hours and with a look at to the future, how we can do more and better with so many interested people and institutions who wish to collaborate. Thank you very much.